Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Saurabh Sharma. I am an assistant professor of political science at Rajiv Gandhi National University of Law, Punjab. My area of interest is China. Based on my experience, I have prepared a 20 lecture course titled Introduction to Chinese Studies. This course is meant for non-specialist Indian students, both at the undergraduate as well as the postgraduate level. I shall attempt to explain the various aspects of China, historical, political, social, economic, etc. in an easily understandable manner. Now, the first question arises is, why is it necessary to understand China? One of the reasons we had to face the humiliation of the 1962 war was, was because we failed to understand the intentions and capabilities of the leaders of the Communist Party of China. Besides, China used to be the largest trading partner of India. This year, uh, last year, it was replaced by the United States. But still, China is uh, the largest exporter to India as well as the second largest trade partner. Therefore, it is very important for the Indian students who in future are going to become political and military leaders, diplomats and business people to have the right understanding of China. So therefore, let us uh, begin with this course. Now, the first lecture of the course is called Origins of Chinese Civilization. The word origins has been used to indicate that there are different narratives on the beginning of China from different perspectives. So it can be archaeological, anthropological, political, historical, mythological. But in this course, we are going to focus on the historical and political perspective. Plus, we are going to include some ideas from the mythological part also to, to make the lectures more entertaining. The other important word here is civilization. What is a civilization? According to Samuel Huntington, humanity is, is say one unit, but humanity is divided into smaller subunits. The the highest level according to Huntington is civilization. So, say be below civilization, there will be nations, states, uh, caste, and so on. So, below humanity, the next level is civilization. So, the common thing about civilization is values. Each civilization has a certain set of values which, which differentiate them from other civilizations. So, according to Huntington, uh, there are eight civilizations. Of course, the names have varied uh, uh, in his book and his essay, uh, but more or less we can say there are eight uh, civilizations. The Western civilization, the Slavo Orthodox civilization, Latin American civilization, Chinese civilization, Hindu civilization, uh, Islamic civilization, Buddhist civilization, African civilization, and Japanese civilization. So, eight in, in, in number. Now, you must understand civilization does not indicate religion here. So, we can understand this because Western civilization has been differentiated with the Slavic Orthodox civilization and the Latin American civilization. All three are Christian, but they are different civilizations. That is based on the history of uh, the development of, of these civilizations. Similarly, civilization also does not mean uh, the same race. Within the same race, there can be different civilizations. Say, Japanese civilization has been considered separate from the Confucian or the Chinese civilization, although they uh, are same race. Uh, similarly, say in South Asia, uh, Hindus, Muslims are considered to be, are of course the same race, but according to Huntington, they are part of two different civilizations. So the idea is <clears throat> the people living in one civilization share a common history. Uh, let's take the example of some of the civilizations that you might be familiar with. Say uh, West. What do you mean by West? 
Now, West here does not mean a, a geographical West because say, Latin America is also in the West, but it is not considered to be part of the West. Uh, West here means a, a civilizational entity. So, uh, it shares a common uh, heritage uh, through the Greek city states, Greek philosophers, so on, the Roman Empire, and then Christianization of the Roman Empire, followed by uh, the division between the East and the West. So, so the Slavic Orthodox become separate from the West uh, due to the schism in the church between East and the West. Then uh, we have the Renaissance, Reformation, Enlightenment, Age of Discovery, Colonialism, the two world wars, Cold War and so on. So this, this common history makes West a, a single civilization with certain values based on individual rights, democracy and so on. Say, let's take case of India. So in India also we have a, a common history, a beginning say with, with uh, say the Vedic age, okay, then we have the various kingdoms and the expansion of, of the civilization in, uh, into uh, different parts of Asia, Buddhism, uh, then we have the, uh, the foreign invasion, Turkey, Turkic invasions, Islamic rule uh, that is followed by uh, the European powers coming and colonizing and then the freedom struggle and so on and so forth. So, in, in that way, people who share this kind of a common heritage have developed certain common values, which we call as the Indian civilization. So, similarly, if you take China into account, Chinese people also have a shared heritage. Okay, they have about uh, 4000 odd years of civilization beginning with the early times. We are going to look into details in this uh, particular lecture. So, Chinese people also share certain uh, common values common heritage and that is why China is also a civilization. Now, this was say the view of Samuel Huntington, uh, but if you say uh, if you take a kind of a historical view, civilization emerges when a group of people settle in a piece of land that is possible only if uh, they, they it is based on agriculture and agriculture uh, is best uh, suited to river valleys. Therefore, the earliest civilizations emerged in river valley civilization. For example, the Nile, Mesopotamia, the Sapta Sindhu in India, or the Yellow River in China. So you can see here a map. In this map, you can see this river here. Yeah, this is a large river. Yeah, it starts from here, ends in the sea here. So this is the Yellow River. Wang He. Wang means yellow, He means river. So it's simply called Yellow River. Now it's interesting why is it called Yellow River? Because this area is uh, quite muddy. So the mud uh, mixes with the water and it becomes, it looks, uh, looks yellow in color. Okay, therefore the Chinese people simply referred to it as Yellow River or Wang He. Now according to certain uh, mythological narratives in China, uh, the human beings are also made of mud, which is yellow. So, the humans are also considered to be yellow okay. and the Chinese people actually have referred to themselves as yellow race or yellow people. Okay. So, the color yellow is very important to Chinese civilization. Let us look at the next slide here. Now, this is the yellow emperor. Okay. Yellow emperor again Wang Ti. Wang means uh, yellow obviously and Ti means emperor. Emperor Actually, the term T is uh, refers to some kind of a heavenly being, okay, a, a kind of a divine being. For example, say in the word Shang Ti, Shang Ti was the highest god of the Shang dynasty. So, T refers to a heavenly creature. So, the yellow emperor is considered to be the father of all the Chinese people. He is considered to be a common ancestor of the Chinese people, okay. He is called Wang Ti. This is a temple dedicated to Wang Ti, okay. So, here also you can see the color yellow. And the descendants of, of uh, the uh, yellow emperor are known as the Huasia people, okay, Huasia, Huasia people, okay, Huasia. Hua means flowery or beautiful, Sia means great, okay, so they, uh, the Chinese people call themselves great beautiful people. Okay, so, so this is an idea of uh, the Chinese uh, beginning of Chinese civilization. 
and uh, the, the emperor in China used to be considered to be the ruler of all, not just of that particular territory, because for the Chinese people, China represented the entire humanity. Okay, so, so the emperor, the Chinese emperor was the lord of all, all under heaven. Okay, everything under heaven actually was ruled by the Chinese emperor, according to the Chinese understanding. In that also, you have to see this, Chung Po. So, this is the Chinese name for China. So, we call China as China, but in the Chinese language, the most common term used for their country is Chung Po. Chung means middle, Kuo means kingdom or country. Okay, so China is Chung Kuo or middle kingdom in Chinese. So, for the Chinese people, China is at the center of the world. Okay. So, on the top there is heaven, in the middle there is the emperor, at the bottom there is the earth. Okay, so the Chinese emperor rules over all under heaven. The entire earth is ruled by the Chinese emperor because Chinese emperor is an intermediary between heaven and earth. Okay, so 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 for for the Chinese people, this idea is very important. It leads to their concept of nationalism and patriotism. Okay, they say this, uh, they consider themselves to be special. Uh, nothing new. Uh, every country has its own narrative like that. For example, in America, there is this concept of the chosen people, manifest destiny. In India, also we uh, in the say in the Vedic times, this concept of the Arya and so on. Uh, uh, people generally consider themselves to be special. So Chinese people also think in that way, and uh, but they still retain this term. Okay, the Chung Po. So, Chung Po or Middle Kingdom is still retained. So, China is in the middle, others are all around China. Okay. So, I have uh, created this particular diagram to explain this concept. So, you can see here, this is the Sinocentric world order. This is how the Chinese people used to look at the world. In fact, I would say still today, this type of concept exists in China. Now, you can see the red circle here, the red circle in the middle. So, the red circle is Chung Kuo or the Middle Kingdom. This is the place where the Huasia people live. Okay, today, um, uh, we call the Huasia people as the Han Chinese people because there used to be a great Han dynasty. And so, after that Han dynasty, today, Chinese people are known as the Han Chinese people. Now, what is the common characteristic of the Han Chinese people or the Huasia people? They speak a common language. Although this language has different dialects, so say, uh, uh, Cantonese is quite different from Mandarin, you cannot understand. If you learn Mandarin, uh, you won't be able to understand Cantonese because they are quite different. But both have the common script. So Chinese language is written in the same script everywhere, but pronounced differently. So the same character because it's it's a pictorial language. Okay, as as you could see here, Chung Kuo, it's a pictorial language. It's a picture. Okay, so so uh, this is not a, a character based on syllable like we have A B C. It's not like that. Chung represents a concept. Okay, you can see Chung. This one represents a concept. It means middle. You can see the line goes in the middle. So, it means in the middle. So, Chung. So, this is in Mandarin. In, in, in Cantonese, I do not know Cantonese. So, in Cantonese, some other word will be used to pronounce the same symbol. Okay. Meaning will be the same and the writing will be the same. So, the common script actually united the Chinese people and helped the Chinese emperors to communicate with the entire country. Now, in the middle of the of the middle kingdom, you can see this thing, small thing here in yellow. This is Qing. Qing simply means capital. What is the capital of China? Beijing. Beijing. Okay, people get confused. Like it's called Beijing, or uh, uh, sometimes it is used as Peking, like this. This is the uh, the English used to use it like this. But today the standard is this is the standard which is approved by the uh, government of China. So Pei. Pei means north, Qing means capital. So, Peiching simply means northern capital. So, if Peiching is northern capital, there would be a southern capital also, that is Nanqing. <coughs> so, Nan means south. So, they simply add the Nan. So, you must have heard about Nanqing, the famous Nanqing massacre, uh, which, which Japanese committed uh, during the Second World War against China. So, China used to have two capitals, Peiching and Nanqing. Of course, not in the beginning, Beijing came uh, much later, but uh, just to explain this concept, I, I give you an example. Or say, Pei and Nan has been used in other places also. For example, Ha Pei, Ha Nan, or Hu Pei, 
Hunan. These are the different provinces of China. Okay, there. So, so this uh, Hupei means northern He, uh, Hepei means northern He, and Hunan means southern He. Hupei means northern Hu, and Hunan means southern Hu. Okay, so there. That means geographically, you can understand one is at the north, other is to the south. Similarly, say uh, there is another thing called Guangxi and Guangdong. Okay, here C means the west, Tung means the east. Okay, so they simply added that. That means they are they are nearby. One is to the west, other is to the. Okay, so let me clean this up here. Now, uh, so capital is very important in China because capital is the place where the emperor lives. Okay, the emperor is an intermediary between heaven and earth. So heaven communicates with earth through the capital. So capital is a very important place in China. It's very well protected. Concept is very strong. Although there have been different capitals in China, today Beijing is the capital. Now beyond the Middle Kingdom, there are other territories ruled by other rulers. Now these are can be of two types. They are either tributaries. You can see here the green circle represents the tributaries here, the green circle. These are the tributaries. And the outer circle, the blue circle are the barbarians. So there are two types of state outside of China according to the Chinese view. One set are known as tributaries, the other set are known as the barbarians. Now what is the difference? The tributaries are those countries or those people who have kowtowed to the, this is the anglicized word, means to hit your head on the floor. So any country or any people who have accepted the greatness of Chinese empire have bowed down before the Chinese emperor, accepted the Chinese culture as superior and take help from China, uh, pay them tribute and so on and so forth are known as the tributaries. Now traditionally many countries have, have been tributaries of China. Let us let's look at the next slide here. This is a map. Now this is a 1900 map of China, this is an American map. Now you can see here the green part. The green part, this is the actual Chung Kuo. This is the place where the Han Chinese people are in the majority. Maybe the, some areas here also like Yunnan, there are a lot of minorities. Some people, uh, places are here like these places, there are a lot of minorities. But more or less this area is the territory of the Han Chinese people. Okay, Traditionally this has been part of the Chinese empire. So this is the middle kingdom. But beyond that you can see some other areas which have been part of Chinese empire. But these are places populated by non-Chinese people. These people speak other languages than the Chinese language. Their culture is quite different from the Chinese culture. For example, Tibet. So this is the territory of Tibet where the language is Tibetan. Now Tibetan script is completely different from the Chinese script. It is based on the Sanskrit uh, script. Okay, so Tibetan culture, Buddhist culture, it is quite different from the Chinese culture. Even Buddhism is different. Chinese Buddhism is different from Tibetan Buddhism. But uh, the Dalai Lama who used to be the head of, 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 of uh, Tibet accepted the suzerainty of the Chinese emperor. He, so Tibet became a tributary of the Chinese em empire at some point of time. Similarly, say this is the Xinjiang province. Xinjiang means simply means new province or new territory. Xinjiang means new territory. So this was actually conquered by China later on in history. This area is now populated by the Uyghur people who are a Turkic people. Okay, so obviously they speak a different language. This is Mongolia. Mongolia used to be part of China. Uh, now it is an independent country. Some portion of Mongolia called Inner Mongolia, Mongolia is part of, still part of China. The, and this is Manchuria. So all these people used to speak different languages. But at some point of time, they became tributaries to China. Now, uh, now I told you Tibet and Xinjiang uh, became tributaries through, uh, say, conquest. But Mongolia and Manchuria is quite different story. In fact, it is the Mongols and the Manchus who conquered China. But they became Chinese. They adopted the Chinese culture, although they retained their identity, separate identity. But in their administration, they adopted the Chinese language, Chinese way of life and so on. So basically, by conquering China, they became Manchuria and Mongolia became part of China. So Chinese still claim Mongolia and Manchuria to be actually part of the Chinese civilization. Okay, so, so these are tributaries. Uh, traditionally, there have been other tributaries, Korea. Okay, Korea has been a tributary of China till the uh, Japanese conquered Korea. 
after defeating the Chinese. Vietnam, Vietnam uh, also adopted the Chinese civilization, the Chinese way of life. Chinese script and so on. The Koreans also did that. Japanese also to an extent did that. But Japanese had, uh, throughout their history, they, they opposed the Chinese. And therefore, J Japan used to be some, somewhere in the middle. Some points of history, they adopted Chinese culture. So, uh, they were treated as a tributary. But at other points, they basically rebelled against the Chinese uh, hegemony. And so, in, in, in those cases, they, they would be treated as barbarians. In fact, the Chinese used to make fun of the Japanese as little barbarians because of the shorter height of the Japanese people. They were called the little barbarians. But the most feared barbarians for China were the northern barbarians, the northern tribes in Mongolia. So, so you can see here, this is uh, say roughly the great, uh, let me clear this first. So, uh, roughly this is the great wall of China. Now, what does what the great wall of China signify? South of the Great Wall of China is abode of the Huasia people. Not because the uh, Great Wall of China was built to keep away the northern tribes. So, this is the territory of the northern tribes who are referred to as barbarians because they refused to accept the superiority of Chinese civilization. They had their own way of life. There used to be different uh, tribes. The last ones uh, perhaps are the Mongols and the Manchus in the various tribes that have existed in uh, what is what can be called Central Asia. Okay, so they, uh, the Chinese people were quite afraid of the barbarians. That's why they built the wall. Now, this term barbarians was also used for the Europeans. So, the Europeans, because ke they came to the sea, so they were called as sea barbarians. Okay, so, because obviously the Western people did not accept the Chinese superiority. In fact, they dominated China and, and colonized China. And therefore, they were also called as barbarians. Okay, so this is, so this map represents this idea. Okay, that... Uh, uh, the, the Chinese people look at the world in, in, in these, these different categories. Okay, capital at the center, then the middle kingdom, then the tributaries, and beyond that, the barbarians. But the interesting thing, uh, this is not part of, of the current discussion, but uh, because the map is in front of me. You can see here, Aksai Chin is shown here as part of India and not as part of China. This is an American map, 1900. Okay, this is before the dispute between India and China came to fore after, after the Communist Party came to power. But till then, you can see here, internationally, Aksai Chin was actually considered to be part of the princely state of Jammu and Kashmir, which was part of the British Indian Empire. In fact, Arunachal to a large extent is also shown as part of India here, although this is before the Shimla Conference of 1914 when the McMahon line was drawn. Okay, so this is very interesting here. Now, uh, the Chinese tendency is if any country in any point of history had cowed out before the Chinese emperor for whatever reason, the Chinese generally considered those countries to be part of their sphere of influence. Say, for example, Nepal. In the 1850s, the, the Gorkhas invaded Tibet, and to this, uh, the Tibetan government, the Chinese empire sent their troops. So they fought against the Nepalese and, uh, in fact, entered into the Nepalese territory. And then the treaty was signed uh, by which the Gorkhas accepted the tributary status with the Chinese. Okay, so, Chinese still considered their right to influence the politics of Nepal. Although India is more dominant player there, but uh, Chinese actually resent that particular thing. Similarly, in uh, Sri Lanka, now in the, in the 1420s and 1430s, uh, Cheng He, the great Chinese admiral, he, he, he with his large ships had uh, visited different parts of the world, including Sri Lanka, where he captured a king there and took him all the way to uh, China where he out of for the Chinese emperor. Sri Lanka is also part of the tributary system of China. Okay, so this is very, very, very interesting. Okay, so here I have uh, basically given you a picture of the beginning of the origins of Chinese civilization, what the Chinese people think about themselves and their country, so on. Now, let us look at um, some interesting uh, ideas from Chinese mythology. Now, this is Han Ku. Han Ku. Uh, now, what is the story of Fanku? Although this story came later, it is not there in the beginning of Chinese civilization. The earliest records do not mention him. But eventually, this became a kind of a popular creation myth in China, how this world was created. Okay, you can see Fanku here. So, in, in the hand of Fanku here, there is this circle, circular object or spherical object here. So, this uh, is, is like a cosmic egg. 
Okay, this is quite similar to the concept of Hiranya Garva in the Vedas and, and how the Purusha is created out of the, the Hiranya Garva and different parts of the Purusha's body are, are different uh, aspects of the universe. So, this is something similar. Now, this is actually a symbol of a concept known as Thai Chi Tu. Thai Chi Tu. Okay, Thai Chi Tu uh, is, a, is a symbol. Now, Thai Chi Tu consists of two parts the dark part and the bright part. Okay, so, so say Thai Chi Tu exactly it will be like this. So, this is the circle. One side is will be black, the other side would be white. So, they represent two aspects of reality in and yang in and yang in and yeah you must have heard of these two words in refers to the feminine aspect which is uh, compared to darkness which is compared to uh, cold which is compared to the earth and so on and yang is the masculine aspect which is compared to uh, brightness which is compared to energy which is compared to the sky which is compared to uh, the sun and so on okay in and now, according to the Chinese myth, there was this cosmic egg consisting of yin and yang and, uh, and there was nothing else. Out of this egg, Fan Pu was born. Fan Pu was born out of this egg and uh, as a result what happened is yin and yang separated. One became the sky, the other became the earth and uh, every day the sky moved upwards. 10 feet every day and while the earth expanded 10 feet okay so it became thicker and thicker by 10 feet and to maintain the connection between sky and earth fungu also grew 10 feet so it was fungu which was connecting the earth with the sky so in this way fungu lived for 18000 years okay so in 18000 years there was this huge distance created between sky and the earth. So, today sky is far away and earth is far below. Okay, so that is the concept. After 18,000 years, Hanku dies. Okay, he dies after 18,000 years and different parts of his body become different things. Okay, let me give an, a few examples. For example, his breath becomes the wind, his voice becomes the thunder, his left eye becomes the sun, his right eye becomes the moon. His hair, hair of his head become the stars and his limbs become the mountains. The veins in his body become the rivers, flesh becomes the farmland, the fertile land, the bones become the minerals, the teeth become the metals, the skin hair becomes the vegetation, the trees and so on, the sweat becomes the rain and in fact the life in his body become the different organisms. Perhaps the human beings grow from that or perhaps uh, uh, his spirit uh, turn into humans and so on. So, there are different uh, narratives on Fangku also. So, this is very interesting. So, according to the Chinese myths, this is how the universe is created, which I think is quite similar with, 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 the, with the Vedic uh, myth of creation. Now, as, as, as I told you that the Chinese people consider themselves to be descendants of the yellow emperor or Wang Ti. Wang Ti was uh, succeeded by different emperors. Uh, which we who are considered to be mythical in, in, in uh, origin. Their historicity is not proven. The first historical dynasty of, of China is considered to be the Xia dynasty, okay, which comes about around uh, the uh, 20th century BCE, which is about 4000 years ago. Now, uh, Xia dynasty is supposed to be founded by the legendary emperor, okay, Yu, uh, also called the Yu the Great, because China used to have a lot of problem with floods. You know, Yellow River is celebrated in China. It's a great river. It ensured that China has, has plenty of grains and allowed a large population to be sustained and China was able to build such a great civilization because of that. Agriculture is very important for civilization. As I was telling you, uh, a, a civilization starts when people settle down in a, uh, in a place. So, uh, before settling down, people follow a kind of a hunter-gatherer way of life. They uh, uh, go, go out in the forest, hunt animals for food or say they uh, move around gathering uh, different fruit and root from different trees. Okay, So, that is known as a hunter-gatherer society. A hunter-gatherer society is a society of scarcity because there is not enough food. You have to hunt every day or every few days 
in order to gain, gain food and, uh, and say someday you don't get a, a prey, you, don't, you are not able to hunt or you don't get enough food uh, around you, then life becomes difficult. Then you have to move from that place to another place where there is more food. Okay, so that is the nature of a hunter-gatherer society. An ag agricultural society ensured that there is plenty of food because you are controlling your own food. Now you are growing your own food. Okay, so, so you are settled around uh, near a river and you are growing your own food. And, and so there is enough food for a large number of people. As a result, population begins to grow okay, because of this plentiful of food. So agricultural society becomes the basis of civilization. So in China, the Yellow River was able to sustain a great civilization. So because of plenty, uh, plenty food, you don't have to go looking for food every day. Then you get a lot of time to think about higher things, higher arts, okay, say music, literature, religion, all these things emerge because people have free time to think. Otherwise, every day you would be struggling for food. So, so long as you are struggling, you won't be able to build a civilization. So, Yellow River actually sustained the Chinese civilization. But the problem with the Yellow River was floods. It used to flood frequently. As a result, uh, you know, a lot of land was uh, uh, covered by, by waters. As a result, agriculture became difficult. So, the Chinese people have been struggling with this problem. Now, Emperor Yu is supposed to have solved this problem by building canals. Okay, he built several canals, and uh, uh, these canals basically diverted waters to different parts of China. As a result, Chinese territory grew because now you could take the water from the to the river canals. Uh, you could take the water from the Yellow River to different parts of China. So those places also could be used as agricultural land. So, he is also considered to be the father of Chinese irrigation and he founded a dynasty known as the Xia dynasty. Perhaps this term Xia comes from the Hua Xia people. Okay, so, he named his dynasty after the people, Xia dynasty. So, his descendants kept on ruling China. This is, this is actually um, uh, part of Chinese uh, traditional history. We do not have exact uh, uh, proof to say that exactly this is how things happen, but this is this is how Chinese have written their history and uh, there is no reason to say that it is false Okay, in, in terms of say Xia dynasty being the first dynasty. We do not have much in terms of archaeological records. They are finding certain things that there was a civilization in China at that point of time, uh, but still uh, generally it is considered to be historically accurate. Okay, so the story goes like this that the descendants of Yu they continued to rule over China for many centuries. Eventually, the Xia dynasty was overthrown by the Shang dynasty. That is the second Chinese dynasty, the Shang. For the Shang dynasty, a lot of uh, archaeological evidence has been found in the form of oracle bones. Oracle bones. Okay, oracle bones basically are made of uh, the fish bone and uh, in that where are engraved uh, Chinese characters which are basically offerings to, to the gods asking for boon and asking for supporting the and, and it also contains the name of the person performing the ritual, the name of the king and so on. So, large number of oracle bones have been found in China which establishes the Shang dynasty actually existed. And it is it, supposed to have uh, ruled China for many, many years. Okay, it, it, it lasted for a very long time. Now, here we are talking about the Yellow uh, Valley civilization. Okay, so this is these are people around the Yellow River. That does not mean there were not other people in other parts of China. The largest river in China is not the Yellow River, it is the Yangtze River. Yang, sorry, Yang, I will write it again. Yang. Yangtze is the largest river in China, which is the south, the south of the Yellow River. So there are people settled there also. Other parts of China also, different people were settled. But uh, in terms of civilization, okay, Chinese civilization started around the Yellow River and gradually it expanded through conquest. The different dynasty conquered parts of China one by one, assimilated the people already existing people into the Chinese civilization. Okay. As a result, they also became Chinese people. 
Okay, Shang dynasty was also very limited, although the title of emperor is used for uh, by them also, but uh, it was very uh, limited in terms of geography. The highest god, as I have already mentioned, of the Shang people was the Shangti. Okay, so there are many gods. The highest god was Shangti. Many of these offerings were made to Shangti. Uh, now, uh, the Shang dynasty eventually declined, their power declined, and a neighboring dynasty known as the Chou dynasty, the third one here, Chou, Chou dynasty, in 1046 BCE, defeated the Shang dynasty and came to power. Now, Chou dynasty is considered to be the, the dynasty that, that created the classical Chinese civilization. Most of the great Chinese classics are written during the Chou dynasty period. So, we have a lot of evidence of this particular period because there is recorded history okay, from the literature and the classics. We know that Chou dynasty existed and what happened during this particular period. The Chou dynasty ruled China for a very, very long time, but uh, that does not mean that uh, they control the whole of China. Okay, so, although uh, the Chou emperor was considered to be the son of heaven, Gradually, the control of uh, the Chou Emperor declined and regional rulers became more and more powerful. Okay, so, there are two interesting periods. You can see spring and autumn period 771 to 7, 7, uh, 476 BCE and the warring states period for, from 476 to 221 BCE. Now, during these two periods, China was divided into several kingdoms, okay, which were virtually independent, although the Chou Emperor remained in the capital, the rest of China was controlled by different regional leaders. Now, uh, the names of these period come from the texts that refer to them. For example, spring and autumn annals talk about the spring and autumn period. Now, the warring state period is called so because during this time, these states were fighting with one another to become the dominant power in China and overthrow the Chou dynasty. So, there is a contest for power and therefore it is known as warring states period. Now, this period of disunity actually was philosophically and intellectually the best period of China because a lot of ideas, a lot of philosophers emerged during this period. Okay. The great Confucius was during the spring and autumn period. Other thinkers like uh, Mencius and, and uh, Sun Tzu and uh, the legalist philosophers and the Taoist philosophers, all of them emerged during this warring states period. Okay? These ideas emerged. So, this period is also known as the hundred schools of thought period. Okay? So, there is a Chinese saying, let the hundred flowers blossom, let hundred schools of thought contend. So, this saying comes from this period because of the richness of Chinese philosophy and Chinese intellectual tradition during this period. Okay, so, 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 the, uh, so uh, these different uh, kingdoms are fighting one another during this. Eventually, one of these kingdoms, okay, uh, belonging to the, the Qin people, Qin, Q-I-N here, Qin, that kingdom conquered the other kingdoms under the leadership of the person who came to be known as Shi Wangti, Qin Shi Wangti. Okay. So, he conquered all other kingdoms and united China. Okay. China became one empire under Shi Wangti. He took a one, once he conquered the rest of, of, of China, he took the title of Shi Wangti. Now, can you notice one thing here? Wang Ti, Yellow Emperor, Shi Wang Ti. It simply means the first emperor belonging to the Qin dynasty. He followed uh, a tradition the, called the legalist tradition, okay, legalist or legalism, which was uh, an opponent of Confucianism. Okay, legalism was an opponent of Confucianism. Now, Confucius believed in tradition, you know, for Confucius, uh, the past was great. The beginning of the Chou dynasty period was the best period in, in Chinese history. Duke of Chou, Duke of Chou, who was the younger brother of the first uh, Chou uh, emperor, 
he was the ideal because uh, you know after his brother died he did not himself become the king but made his his nephew as the king the son of the dead emperor while he ruled the country and he created so many institutions and so many concepts which which chinese people continued to follow for several centuries he never wanted to be king so he was like a sage a, a enlightened being okay who wanted to do good for the people for so for confucius duke of chou was the ideal legalists did not believe in such concepts for the legalists everything was based on uh, control of human beings okay state should be based on control of people through rewards and punishment human beings by nature are evil they are prone to do evil things and in order to prevent that the king has to be very strict very harsh there should be very strict punishment for crimes and if someone behaves properly they should be properly rewarded so that's why it's known as legalism it's it, it, it's a kind of a proto form of rule of law okay law has to be followed everyone has to obey the law everyone has to be under the emperor so shri wangti believed in this concept okay so based on this applying this concept he reunited china or united china into uh, what uh, what came to be known as the first empire now he wanted to be the 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 first emperor okay so he hated the confucians of course he was a legalist and he did not want the records of uh, ancient history to remain in china he wanted the history of china to begin with him himself okay and therefore he uh, he said that he buried 460 confucian scholars alive okay he caught them and buried them alive i don't know how how true it is but basically the confucians have have recorded this incident so there could be some doubt with regards to that because it's written by the by his opponents but still it's very interesting that uh, he is supposed to have buried 460 confucian scholars alive and then he ordered the burning of books he ordered that all the old books should be burned and history should begin with himself of course uh, he was not able to succeed and many of the books survived uh, we still have them with us now he is also famous for other things like he became this great ruler he had nothing else to achieve uh, so he wanted to be, remain immortal okay so he used to try uh, different uh, what are known as elixirs of immortality okay drinks or different concoctions which will make him immortal okay he used to try these different things uh, eventually one such con concoction he said led to his death okay he was poisoned and he died because of that suddenly he died in 210 bce he is also believed to have created the great wall of china wall building was a very ancient enterprise in china even during the warring state period different kingdoms had built walls around them to protect themselves from Uh, the outside world to protect themselves from other countries so wall wall building was a quite a, a prevalent uh, enterprise in china uh, so shri wangti being the ambitious ruler he was he wanted to create the great wall okay which protect entire china not just one province but entirety of china okay so he began this project of building the great wall of china to keep the northern tribes away uh now this was a very difficult enterprise large number of soldiers died it is said that bodies of the soldiers were buried within these walls uh, to, to be used as material to build the wall and so on so whoever went there did not return something like that of course the current great wall was renovated uh, by by the later rulers and so on so but the original great wall is supposed to have been built by shri wangti another famous uh, uh, destination connected with uh, shri wangti is is uh, siam another uh, capital of china uh, siam siam has what is known as the terracotta army i don't know if you have if you have seen this before on tv or something like that uh, you must have terracotta army has this large human size soldiers and their horses chariots and all kinds of such a whole military was created out of terracotta and uh, after his death shri wangti was buried there okay so he believed that uh, a time might come when he will be revived okay he will come back to life and for that time he needed an army to again reconquer the world okay and therefore he built this uh, particular monument to himself okay 
known as terracotta aluminum so when people go to china they visit this important historical location if you have watched the the uh, mo uh, movie series mummy okay there's the third third movie ma the mummy tomb of the emperor where jet li plays the role of shri wangti so the mummy that comes to life is actually shri wangti in that particular movie so so but because he was such a cruel ruler he was so ambitious and cruel and he was very harsh upon the people and he did not believe in in using say uh, myths and, and uh, ideas to control people unlike the confucians who believe that traditions rituals are more important in order to control the people and as soon as he died people were so upset with him that his dynasty was overthrown his his dynasty did not last for a very long time after his death as you can see here he died in 210 bce and his dynasty came to an end in 206 bce so his um, uh, successors were not as uh, capable as shri wangti the next dynasty that came to power was the han dynasty okay 206 bc the founder of the han dynasty was a peasant and he was able to uh, build an army and overthrow the qin dynasty and establish the han dynasty han dynasty gradually expanded and was able to take over the whole of china okay and and so it was such a great dynasty it's known as the golden period in chinese history uh, han dynasty and later on tang dynasty these two uh, dynasties are known as the golden period of chinese history so these dynasties actually so 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 that therefore the chinese people are known as the han chinese people because of the the greatness achieved under the han dynasty okay buddhism also started in china during the han dynasty period the han dynasty went through different periods of highs and lows eventually it came to an end in as you can see 220 ce now historically speaking or even politically speaking there is a very important book of this period records of the grand historian okay records of the grand historian written by han dynasty uh, historian known as sima qian it was started by his father the book was started by his father sima than but he could not complete it he died so sima qian this is considered to be the first properly recorded history book in china okay he completed this in 91 bce and uh, most of the discussions that we will have would would refer to uh, discussions with regard to philosophy plus discussions with regard to the dynasties uh, at least the, the uh, dynasties which are before sima qian we will refer to his book for content okay so that's why this book is very now as far as history writing is concerned you see chinese people have have a tradition of writing recording their history very properly just like the greeks of uh, you know ancient greeks herodotus and thucydides they began writing history in greek there so they are known as founders of uh, history uh, sima qian came after them but he, chinese history is con also considered to be very well recorded especially uh, uh, from this chou dynasty period onwards so uh, so if you compare that with india we will find that there is a lack of history writing in india many people say we are, we also have our history the puranas are our history but you see the puranas only mention a list of kings it does not go into the details of who these kings were what are their achievements only a list is given and 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 these list of course go into millions of years which is not scientifically acceptable okay so that is not proper history proper history is is like uh, sima qian records because even china in china you can see there are different myths uh, references to mythical uh, kings and so on that is not considered to be history in the cia dynasty period onwards that period is considered to be to be history now so uh, right now i would i would like to uh, so i stop here i'll summarize uh, what we have discussed so far and in the next lecture we are going to go into some interesting ideas that come from uh, chinese history okay so let me summarize this particular today's lecture so uh, today we looked into uh, the concept of civilization how the civilizations in different parts of the world began in the river valleys when people settled down doing agriculture so chinese civilization begins in the yellow river valley wang he wang means uh, yellow he means river as you can see here 
so the color yellow is very important it comes because of the yellowish color of the mud which mixes with the water and turning the river into yellow similarly the ancestor of the chinese people is also known as the yellow emperor and the chinese people themselves are referred to as huaxia people then we look into uh, the the concept of chung kuo uh, middle kingdom that uh, uh, china is basically at the center of the world and we looked into this particular diagram okay which which uh, divides the world into the middle kingdom where the chinese people live then the tributaries who kowtow for the chinese state and the barbarians who oppose the chinese state okay so this concept of kowtow is very important even when we discuss the contemporary politics i am going to refer to this particular concept i discussed this map of china also uh, which was very interesting and then we discussed the creation myth one of the creation myths of china uh, the story of fangku okay fangku and then we went into the chronology of the different china, uh, chinese dynasties especially the first three dynasties xia shang and zhou and then how shi wang united china into one great empire and how his empire then collapsed and was replaced by the han dynasty okay so we are going to continue with uh, with the second lecture next time thank you Hello, welcome to the 20 hour course on introduction to Chinese studies. I am Saurabh Sharma, assistant professor in the School of Arts, Humanities and Social Sciences, Chanakya University, Bengaluru. Before this, I was assistant professor of political science in the Rajiv Gandhi National University of Law, Punjab. I have studied Chinese studies from the center for East Asian Studies, School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. I basically teach political science and international relations to undergraduate students. So this course offers you some basic ideas on China that I have learned over the years from teachers of Chinese studies as well as from my own experience interacting with Chinese scholars as well as visiting China. In this particular course, there, there are 20 lectures. You can see this is the list of the lectures that we have. Let me briefly go through this list. First lecture would be on the origins of Chinese civilization in which I talk about where the Chinese civilization began, how it began and what are the main ideas that constituted Chinese civilization. The second lecture is on a very, impo on a very important concept in Chinese political thought known as mandate of heaven. So this thought came about in the Zhou dynasty period and it that is about uh, 1000 BCE and since then each coming dynasty has use this concept in order to justify their own rule. Number three, Confucianism. Confucianism was the official ideology of the Chinese state for almost 2000 years and the civil service exam in China was based on Confucian classics. So this lecture gives us the details of the Confucian ideas and the important texts re related to Confucianism. Number four is the schools of ancient Chinese thought. So Confucianism is not the only school in Chinese thought. There are other thoughts like legalism, Taoism, Moism and many others. So this lecture would give you a brief account of each of these schools and explain to you how these ideas emerged and 
what these ideas contained. The fifth lecture would be on religion in China, which would go into the ancient religion of China and how these religions have developed over time plus the influence of foreign religions on China and the current status of religion in China. The number six is society and education in China. So this is going to discuss the social situation in China from a point of view of religion and then uh, discuss the education system in China, especially science and technology and its influence on modern China. Then the next two lectures deal with the concept of century of humiliation. So this period uh, would be from say uh, around uh, 1839 or 1842, you can take either to 18, uh, 1949 when uh, China, uh, People's Republic of China was established. So this is the Chinese discourse on imperialism. Then the ninth lecture would be on Mao Zedong thought. Mao Zedong was the founding father of the People's Republic of China. So what were his political ideas? Then number 10 uh, would be on the transition of China to market socialism. How China shifted from Mao's, Mao's thought to market thought. So this uh, began in 1978. So Mao died in 1976. And from 1976 to 1978, there was a transition. And so this particular lecture is going to deal with that transition period. And then we have two lectures on the Chinese political system. China is ruled by the Communist Party of China. So its system is a bit different from say the political system in India or United States or any other democratic country. So these two lectures will go into details of how Chinese political system is organized. Then the next four lectures deal with India-China relations. So first we start with the geopolitics and the boundary dispute. So beginning with uh, say about 300 BCE when both these nations came into con contact up to uh, 1949 when, when People's Republic of China was established. So this is kind of a background on the India-China relations. Then we are going to discuss the period from 1949 to 1962. This is a period when there was hindi chini bhai bhai between India and China and then that eventually led to the 1962 war. So this lecture is going to cover both these uh, things, hindi chini bhai bhai as well as the war. And then from 1962 to 1993, we have a period when there was conflict, there were attempts at peace. So we are going to discuss all that. And then finally, 1993 to 2021 is the contemporary period when there is a kind of a strategic competition that has emerged between a rising China and a rising India. Then the 17th lecture would deal with China in the Cold War. So what was China's foreign policy from 1949 to 1989? And I have divided that into three phases. So we are going to discuss those three phases within the Cold War. And then in the next lecture, we are going to discuss the rise of China that is from the in the post-Cold War period that is from 1989 to 2023. Uh, we are going to look at whether the rise of China is a threat, whether it's an opportunity or it's just a myth. In reality, China is not actually rising. So we are going to look into these things. The 19th lecture deals with the geo strategy of China. I look into three main uh, aspects of this geo strategy, the trans Himalayan strategy, the string of pearl strategy and the belt and road initiative. And the final lecture deals with soft power in China's foreign policy discourse. This is the, the main subject of my research. So I am going to present uh, different findings from my research in this particular lecture and this is going to be the last lecture. So I hope you uh, listen to these 20 lectures and learn more about China because China is very important from an Indian point of view. China is the largest neighbor of India and it's a rising power, it's a, it's a great power. So China ca can be a threat to India, it can also be an opportunity for India. So we must keep an eye on China and so if we want to keep an eye on China, we should have a basic knowledge about 
what China is all about, to understand its politics, foreign policy, society, civilization, so on and so forth. So I hope this lecture will help you to get a basic understanding of China. Thank you.